Hey, and welcome to the lecture. Before we jump into the learning, just a quick reminder to check out the workbooks available on modernoptician.com through the Ultimate Apprentice Optician Study Guide or available on Amazon worldwide. It's the best way to accompany this lecture so that you can fill in the blanks, label the diagrams, do everything all concurrently and elevate your training to the next level. All the links to the workbooks and the website are all in the description down below, so make sure to check it out. Other than that, enjoy today's lesson. All right, we're going to start getting into a little bit of pathology now. Uh, for the next few lectures, we're going to talk about some of the more common pathologies that we will encounter. And I feel like most opticians today kind of suck at pathology. And I don't mean, I don't want to be mean about it. Um, I just, I, you know, in my position, I see a lot of opticians. I see a lot of people practicing. I deal with a lot of students. A lot of people have a tough time with pathology. And you, we need to, there's certain pathologies that we really, I think what's happening is that, you know, in their, in their training and throughout their, you know, practicing, it's very easy to walk away from pathology and say, that's somebody else's problem. And a lot of the times that is the case. But there are certain pathologies, and not every single one I'm going to talk about, but there are certain ones that you should know. Strabismus is one that you should know. There's, a, there's three or four of them, that I'm, and I'm going to mention it you know, straight up, saying this is one that we should know. Uh, and when, it, when it's not, you know, I've done a pretty good job, I think, of telling you when to worry and when not to worry. You need to know strabismus because, well, the solutions to strabismus are right in your court because as we're going to talk about in, in a couple of seconds here, uh, things like prism and, and different types of correction are used to correct strabismus. Um, being able to recognize whether it's latent or manifest uh, and stuff like that, and even sometimes catching it in, in children so that you can refer, these are all really important things. So um, don't suck at strabismus, be good at it. And it's not complicated and we're not gonna make it complicated. We're actually gonna simplify it quite a bit. Um, Cause remember we talked about strabismus can often be related to extraocular muscle stuff. And I just told you in the, one of those lectures, not to worry too much about the actions of the muscle cause you're not gonna go in and solve it. But I want you to understand how it works um, and what the negative effects are, especially in children. All right, so let's leave it at that for now and let's move into the, into the lecture itself. So first, strabismus is a general term, okay? It's not specific, strabismus covers lots of stuff. Used to describe a number of conditions in which the eyes do not properly align with each other when looking at an object, okay? Very simple, strabismus is when the two eyes aren't pointing the right direction, as simple, and usually it's one, um, you know, one will stay straight in line and the other one won't. Uh, it can be both, which would be a real big problem. However, for the most part, if the eyes aren't aligned, we can call it a general term of strabismus. Now, strabismus can be manifest, present while a person views a target binocularly. Okay, this type of deviation is referred to as atropia. Now, let's take a second on that. Atropia means that when you look at, when a person's looking at something, when you're assessing them, essentially when they're looking at you, they're trying to focus on you, one eye is out in left field, okay? That is atropia, it's manifest all the time, okay? So, um, it doesn't always show up right away, so that's where people get confused between atropia and the next one we're gonna talk about. <clears throat> However, you know, if a person has perfect fusion in the moment, if you get them to just look at something, you know, if you were to take a pen, say, look at the pen and they try to focus on it, you'll notice that one eye is not properly aligned. And it's usually there all the time. Most people are quite aware that they have atropia and their friends and family and everyone else around them has, are aware, they've noticed, they've probably said, hey, it seems like your one eye is looking off in the other direction. It's not usually a surprise to the patient when they have atropia. Okay, so tropias are pretty easy to recognize. Now, strabismus is only present after binocular vision has been interrupted. Uh, typically, by covering one eye is considered latent, not there all the time, and referred to as a foria. Now, these forias are the ones that are a little bit more complicated for people to understand. So think of it this way. Atropia is when the eye is always out, not in the right direction. 
aphoria is is basically that the eyes when once one of the eyes is able able to target itself onto the object the other eye follows and targets it together so that norm vision looks normal but the moment you cover one eye the other the uh, uncovered eye has a difficult time finding the target and goes away so basically it's like having a lazy eye we use that term a lot right um we hear the term lazy eye and usually a lazy eye is refer people always think of it as uh an eye that is misaligned but in reality a lazy eye is one that can't function on its own okay there's a couple different the term lazy eye in our field is actually a really tough one because it could be used to describe uh, aphoria. It could also be used to describe amblyopia, which we're going to discuss a little bit more. Both conditions very much linked to each other. However, um, we can. I'll try my best to not use the term lazy eye as much as I can because I don't want to confuse between the different things that we use to describe it, right? In this case, we're talking about aphoria, an eye that cannot function, cannot focus on its own. So there's very common tests. Uh, the cover uncover test is a very common one done in screening um, because a person's you know, visual function can look quite normal, but the moment you cover one eye, the other one takes off. Um, and you would test the other side to see if the other does the same. Because you can, And you can also have intermittent and, and constant phorias as well, which we're going to talk about in a little bit more detail in a second. However, just remember tropia there all the time and you see somebody with an eye that's not looking like it's straight at you it's it's a tropia aphoria has to be teased out but it could still be a condition that, that causes people problems because if they're trying to focus on on things where they're reading and things get tired and their eyes get tired sometimes they can start losing that fusion and that stereopsis we just talked about and that can cause further problems so intermittent strabismus is a combination of both manifest and latent forms where a person can achieve fusion, okay, so they're able to get both eyes to work together, but occasionally or frequently falters to the point of manifest deviation. Okay, that's what we we're just talking about. Is a matter of if even if you have like a nice, uh, you know, if both eyes are working nicely together and you don't seem to have any kind of problem. By the way, when a person has no problem, we call that ortho. So if I use that word, it just means normal perfectly aligned so if a person could seem ortho all the time and then they start reading and they get tired all of a sudden they don't notice because they're not looking in the mirror when they're reading but what's happening is one of the eyes is starting to drift away because it's losing fusion it's losing an ability to hold and now that latent problem has become manifest where if someone else was observing them they would be able to see that that eye took off uh, now paralytic strabismus is due to paralysis of one or several extraocular muscles. That's one reason why a person could have strabismus. We talked about in the extraocular muscle portion, we talked about how, you know, one muscle pulls, the other one relaxes, and all these different muscles are working in conjunction. Well, sometimes if one of those muscles isn't working well, it can actually cause strabismus. Where uh, committant strabismus is a deviation that is the same magnitude regardless of gaze of position. Okay, uh, let's just take a second here. No matter where the person looks, so if you were to have a person look through the six cardinal positions that we just talked, the six cardinal movements, the strabismus or the deviation would be the same no matter which way they looked, okay? While incommittent has a magnitude that varies as the person, uh, that's a tongue twister, as the person shifts gaze. Very common to have incommittent strabismus. Um, a lot of the times it doesn't manifest itself <clears throat> until a person converges okay that's a very common time when people will have strabismus is that everything looks straight until they start looking towards their nose uh or if you start if you're doing the cardinal positions and you're bringing the object that they're looking at close to their nose that's when the eye will falter uh or just particular gazes up gaze down gaze uh right left it doesn't matter because it's all it has to do with whatever if, especially if it's paralytic depending on which muscle is not properly formed or injured or just not working well uh it will have an effect on the type of 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 uh, well which gaze the strabismus will manifest itself on all right so we've talked about this whole slide here has been mostly terms right so but i wanted you to understand the terms because these are important i want you to know what a tropia is what a fourier is i want you to understand the concept of intermittent paralytic 
as well as committing and incommitting. These are all important things, and they're not complicated. You've taken your notes in your workbook, I'm sure you have, to make your own little side notes on there as well, and study this because it is very important to understand this. It helps you understand when people are having issues. It also uh, understand PRISM. We haven't talked much about PRISM yet. We're gonna talk in detail in the optics chapter and understanding the correlation between how PRISM works and what it's used to correct is going to be hugely, hugely uh, beneficial for you. So, like I said, this is very important. Now, let's we haven't even looked at pictures yet about what your business looks like. Now that we understand the terms, we can actually apply some of the stuff to the way it would actually look when you were looking at a patient. So here are a bunch of eyes. So the first one, okay, we're going to go through the manifest and latent uh, forms of each, right? So, and I think that you should be able to do this on your own. Um, however, we're going to do it together, <clears throat> but try to test yourself and see if you can kind of understand. So the first one, both eyes are looking directly at us. We talked about it. What is it? It is ortho, normal, right? So whether it's manifest or latent, there are no manifest or latent forms of this. It's all the time. Everything's good. Straight ortho. Now, notice the second picture, second from the top, the one eye seems to be low, doesn't it? So the right eye seems to be depressed a little bit. So in its manifest form, meaning that when you look at the person, it would always be like this, we would call this hypotropia. Hypo meaning low, right, going down. Tropia meaning it's manifest all the time. So if you read in a file that someone had hypotropia, you would assume that, um, and it would be, you know, in this case, it would be OD or you know, OD meaning right eye. It would be hypotropia. Uh, you would know that the person had this all the time. It was visible at all times. Whereas if you had to tease it out and it wasn't always there, it would be hypophoria. You kind of see where this is going? So now, again, in the next picture, the right eye seems a little high. It is hypertropia. And then, of course, if it's in, in a latent form, it has to be teased out, it would be hyperphoria. Next one, the right eye seems to be out uh, towards the right side, seems to be going out towards uh, the, the lateral side of the body that we call this exo, exotropia, because in this case, it would be there all the time. If it's latent, has to be teased out, it is exophoria. Again, poor right eye. This is the right eye that keeps being affected here. Um, <clears throat> looking towards the nose. In this case, it is esotropia, if it's there all the time, and esophoria, if we have to tease it out, okay? So this is something that is very important for you to understand, because think of what you've just figured, under, like learned here is that you understand the difference between a manifest and latent form, a tropia and a phoria, and you also understand the directions. This stuff is discussed all the time. If a patient comes in and you notice something and you wanted to refer, you would actually probably write it. You know, now, keep in mind, you might not always get it right, so sometimes you have to be careful if you're not confident. However, if you know, if you even discuss it amongst colleagues, you could say this person seems to have an esophoria or an esotropia. Um, it just makes you sound smarter and it makes you, when you get good at this and you understand it well and you're actually getting it right, it actually makes everybody better because everyone's understanding each other. Think of it, <clears throat> what's easier, telling somebody that you know you suspect an esotropia or you would say, I suspect that the right eye is turning inwards, uh, not all the time, just sometimes. So in this case, that would be an esophoria. But think of all the words I just said to describe something that we could have said with one term, right? So. Anytime you start asking yourself, why do I need to know this? I'm not going to be a doctor. I'm not going to be writing all these things. No, but you're going to be talking to doctors and you're going to be discussing with colleagues and you're going to be, you just want to understand this stuff better, right? So we just, we just demonstrated that one word will describe something that would take a, a convoluted sentence to describe. So definitely very important. So why? Why do we need to know all this stuff? Of course, I've already, I've just mentioned a whole bunch of reasons why. However, you want to understand misalignment. You want to understand whether, you know, the, the differences between it being present all the time or or latent or you know only present sometimes you want to know the difference between uh committant and incommittent you want to understand the difference you know you basically want to understand you know the sorry the uh, understanding the, the the concept of direction with a hypo hyper uh, eso exo these are all things you want to understand so that you can communicate better and that you just understand it better. Uh, Foria versus tropia, right? <clears throat> Important to understand because, uh, you know, 
you want to be able to name them right, and they have different implications as well. Diplopia. Why do we need to know diplopia? What is diplopia? First of all, it is double vision, right? And phorias and tropias can cause double vision. Very intuitive why. Because if both eyes are not pointing to the same thing, we just talked about the visual pathway. You see how these things all kind of build one, to, one on top of the other? We know that the visual pathway is incorporating the image from the right eye and the left eye. Things are crossing over. If the right eye is looking at something completely different than the left eye, then the brain has the, the task of trying to figure out what the heck do I do with this? And then it gives you two images. That's where double vision comes from, right? If, you, if both eyes are seeing the exact same thing like we want to, the brain can form one nice, concise image. If it's seeing two completely different things, then the brain says, well, I guess we want two of these. Um, and that's when you see double, right? So, and in a lot of patients with phorias and tropias, if not properly addressed, can experience diplopia. It can be really lousy, and it's something that we definitely want to be able to fix. Ambliopia. So I'm going to do an entire lecture on ambli ambliopia, so we're not going to go, you know, 10 minutes on this one. However, ambliopia is when one eye does not see as well as the other, usually related to visual acuity, you know, two, one or two lines or worse uh, <clears throat> from one eye to the other, its ability to see. Uh, that was a really weird backwards way of saying that. I'm sorry. However, amblyopia, uh, and, and, sorry, and we just talked about lazy eye, right? Amblyopia is another term that we often, you know, kind of use lazy eye to describe. However, it just means it doesn't see as well as the other eye. This can often be a result of unaddressed phorias and tropias at a young age. So I don't want to go too deep on this. However, if you do not correct a child with any kind of visual, any kind of stereopsis issues, during developmental stages, usually before the age of 11 or 12, the brain will often not develop the side that's not seeing well, and it will start to work on one side because it figures we have a little bit of a weak link here. Let's develop the, other, the good one and forget about the other one, and you end up with amblyopia. This is a neurological condition. The pathway, the neurological pathway, the visual pathway that we just talked about is not as well developed on one side as the other. You can't come back from that. So <clears throat> if you see strabismus in children and it's not being addressed, you have to make sure this is being addressed. It's not usually the professional. It's not usually the eye doctor who's not doing a good job. All optometrists and ophthalmologists are extremely well aware of the implications of, of amblyopia. They will usually give the parents and patient the best advice. It is then the parent's responsibility to make sure that they're following the advice. That doesn't always happen. So <clears throat> we're going to do an entire lecture on this because I think this is one of the most important concepts we absolutely need to know as opticians because we have to be advocates for the patient. And this is not by no means saying parents are bad parents. However, parents don't often understand how, how you know severe the implications can be <clears throat> and how detrimental things can be in the future. So you have to be an advocate for the child. And, you, and we're going to talk about really nice and soft ways to describe it to, to parents. Um, and, and encourage them that, you know, whether it be patching or the eyeglasses that were prescribed or whatever it may be, why this is extremely important. And so to be continued, we're going to go through that in detail in a future lecture. And prism to correct, we're going to be, you're going to see prism all the time. And I don't want you to look at prism. And then when somebody asks you, if you're ever in, the, you know, the position of being a mentor for another student or something like that, say, why do we see prism? And you say, well, I don't know. It's just because the doctor wants it. No, wrong answer. There's always a reason for why there's prism. And you as the optician should be inquiring why there's prism in the prescription because it helps you understand. It helps you, it helps with continuity of care with the patient. Um, and that's why, that's one of the reasons why working closely with the prescriber is often nice. It's not always the case. Sometimes you have prescriptions coming from outside, but whenever you have a good line of communication with the prescriber, you can understand why this is being used. Prism is often used to correct phorias and tropias to, because if the eyes are not properly aligned, then the prism can help in realign that, the realign the image, essentially change the path of light so that it's going to where that visual axis is on the misaligned eye and allow things to be fused and, you know, provide stereopsis. You know, prism for, um, <clears throat> prism in glasses to correct this kind of thing usually only works when there's a small angle of deviation. Um, major ones, like major tropias can be quite difficult to correct uh, with prism. However, 
if you see prism in the prescription, one of the number one things I would always think about is that there is some kind of strabismus there. There can be other reasons, neurological reasons. Um, however, stra uh, strabismus is a very common cause, especially in children. You see, you see this in children. Um, it's a safe bet to assume there's strabismus. And if there isn't, at least you've had that discussion with the doctor and they can fill you in as to why. Okay, I think we've gone a little bit long on this one, but it was very important. So I'm not mad about it, but I think uh, you've, probably taking your notes and you've got a much better grasp on how this stuff works and a little bit of uh, foreshadowing as to a few things we're going to talk about in the future as well. So that's it for this one and uh, let's move on to the next one.